scripture reading this morning will be from Matthew chapter 25, sorry, Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 through 30. And we will be reading the parable of the talents. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. People of God give attention to the reading of his holy, inspired, and infallible word. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them, and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had five talents came and brought five others, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. When the cat and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this portion of your word. We thank you that it instructs us about days yet to come, but yet how we are to live today. And so, Lord, we pray that you would show us these things, show us these wondrous things contained within your law. Open our minds and our hearts to see what you have for us today in your word as you speak to us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This parable... It is part of the larger chapter uh, or section <coughs> beginning in Matthew chapter 24, which comes from the questions that the disciples have about the things that are yet to come. And so Jesus is using this, this parable along with others, to, to speak to them about these matters. Now, we know that sometimes the parables are to the crowds, other times they are to the disciples. So he is trying to communicate something very important to them about the days yet to come and how they are to live. And we've talked about talents before. In the parable of the unforgiving servant, they are a debt, a debt to be owed. In this parable, talents are not a debt, but a trust. They are entrusted with them to do something with them. And we must remember that every talent is a 
substantial sum of money. We're not, this morning we won't get into all the details of what exactly it is. The more you try to find out how much a talent actually is, the less sure you are. And the best answer is, it's a good portion of money. It's a good portion of money. So we're going to look at first the entrusted servants, then we're going to look at faithful servants, and then finally the unfaithful servant. So as we open up, we see that the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who has called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now, being his disciples, as the ones who are receiving this, they should have immediately recognized that the master in this parable is Jesus himself. Given this whole context of the conversation about the things that are yet to come and, and the final judgment and, and the fact that Jesus is their master, they were discussing the return of Christ. The previous parable was about was one that was about the readiness for the return of Christ. And so, they actually should have seen that this was also one. This is to people who believe that they are disciples of Jesus Christ. And the disciples are being taught to be productive for the kingdom of God. Now, notice I did say that these are for people who believe that they are disciples of Jesus Christ. And I didn't say necessarily people who are disciples of Jesus Christ. Because as we see in this parable, we have two who prove themselves to be faithful and one who proves himself to be unfaithful as a servant. Just as there are many in the church who will prove themselves to be faithful servants faithful followers of Jesus Christ, and others whose religion is merely a formal exercise. And there is no change of heart reflected in servanthood uh, to God. Verse 15. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. As I said before, they are given a significant sum of money, uh, somewhere around a year's pay, for each talent. Note, he is given to them according to their ability. This tells us first that there was an expectation for each servant He was doing this, he knew who they were. He knew his servants. He knew, even before this, in a sense, who would be faithful with what was entrusted to them and who, who was it. This, in a real sense, was a, a test of their ability, of their loyalty, of how well they know their master. So we see in the next few verses, beginning of verse 16, what these uh, servants did with the talents they were given. It says that he who had five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And he likewise would receive two, gain two more, but he who would receive one went and dug it in the ground, dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. We'll talk about some of the differences here as we move along. But we need to dis first discuss the meaning of entrusting the servants with these talents. Maybe it wasn't clear immediately to the disciples, but Jesus was talking about what they would do with the gift of the gospel with which they had been entrusted. That is, the main meaning, I believe, of this, these gifts, these talents that they were given, that they were supposed to do something with. We could also relate it, I guess, to the different spiritual gifts and abilities that God gives to each one of us uh, in different proportions. 
In 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 14, we read, Hold fast to the pattern of sound words, which you have heard from me in, in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. Here, Paul is saying that that good thing that it was committed to them is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is the most precious possession that we have been entrusted with. We as individuals, we as the church, are entrusted with the gospel and entrusted with different responsibilities with regard to the gospel, with regard to our gifts, our circumstances. Jesus wants the disciples to understand that between the time that he departs and the time he returns, they are to be busy doing the master's work. They are to be investing and using what God had given them to advance the cause of the master. Well, in the story, it is the amassing of financial fortune. But the parable is clearly teaching us the bigger principle of building the kingdom of God by adding to the number of those who are being saved. Through evangelism, to discipleship, to church growth, through mission. As you would expect in this parable, the master returns in verse 19. After a large, long time, the Lord of the servants came and settled accounts. He who received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, and listen, their, their responses are similar, and his response to them is similar. Lord, you have delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five talents more besides that. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you rulers over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He who has received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I, gave, I gained two more talents besides them. The Lord said to him, well done. Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. The faithfulness of these servants are rewarded. Their faithfulness is recognized by the master, which I think is something that Jesus is trying to show us, that our faithfulness will be recognized. The first reward that these servants receive is praise. They are called good and faithful servants. As disciples of Jesus Christ, as Christians, as ones who are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, we should desire to hear these words in the day of judgment. We should desire to hear from Christ good and faithful servant. This praise itself would be enough without any further reward. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter 6 and 7, one, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. In this you re greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our obedience will bring glory, honor, and praise to God. That in and of itself is a wonderful reward that we receive that we are giving glory to God. The second reward is that I will make you a ruler. Now, I have to be honest at this point. I'm not completely sure what he means. There is some sort of reward or privilege awaiting for those who are faithful and productive servants of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, 
we are told, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys or where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 8. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to those who have loved his appearing. There is some sense of reward and maybe even possibly responsibility in the eternal final state. But what he is also trying to do is to give us a sense of watchfulness and readiness for the day of his return. Revelation 3.21 To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, and I will also overcome and, and, and I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. To him who overcomes, I will grant with me to sit on my throne. Maybe this has to do with the fact that God refers to his people as a royal priesthood and a holy nation. The point is that God recognizes our obedience and service to him. He will acknowledge it. Even when the world does not see it, or ridicules it, or worse, God keeps account. God knows and stands ready to reward his people. Not as a reward of eternal life, but rewards, can we say, in eternal life? The final reward is to enter the joy of your Lord. This is the reward that is common to all who are in Christ. Everlasting joy in the presence of God. All who are found in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, will experience the joy of the Lord. A hope that we can all hold to. But then it comes to the unfaithful servant, and it is his time to make report. He who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. I hope you notice that the third servant has a drastically different view of the master. The other men didn't accuse him of being a hard or unreasonable man. They understood what was expected of them. And they did. And it seems they did it with some degree of joy. They were happy to report back to the master what they had done. But this servant, he was afraid. <clears throat> he was afraid. Maybe he doesn't have the same relationship with the master that the other two did. After all, it's clear that this person was already known to the master and is given the least of the talents. Matthew Henry calls this the spirit of a slave. This man had the spirit of a slave. The other men show no fear. They only show eagerness. They show obedience. They show a, show a desire to multiply what their servant has. Probably not even knowing that it was coming back to them. This parable 
serves as a wake-up call to those who are slumbering on their discipleship. The Lord, his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. Wicked and lazy. He put in no spiritual effort. None. He is a disciple who does nothing to expand the kingdom of Christ. Spiritual laziness is not the mark of discipleship. Master continues, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. That part, the unfaithful servant's right. He had an expectation that they would do something with the things in which, with which they had been entrusted. His reaction was based out of fear and According to the words of the master, wickedness and laziness. You ought to have deposited my money with the banker. And at my coming, I would have received it back my own with interest. You should have done <coughs> something with it. Master admits, I had an expectation. He doesn't admit to being a hard man. Matter of fact, he seems to be a reasonable man. The other men understood. They knew what was expected of him. So he says, take the talent from him and give it to him who <coughs> has ten talents. Wow. That's already beginning to be harsh. I gave this one to you. This one could have been yours, and instead I'm giving it to him. Because you did nothing with it. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Give my last, last time I preached this, I had to preach this with the interpreter and I had to make sure that they, they knew what a thinly veiled reference was. This is a thinly veiled reference to eternal punishment in hell. Of taking what you, what you have, you don't even have that anymore. As a matter of fact, you're being cast out. Where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. These these men are proving, or this man is proving that he is not a true disciple of Jesus Christ. If he had, he would have done something other. This is a warning to the disciples. It's a warning to them. I'm getting ready to entrust you with something of great value, and I expect of you to do something with it. You have the words of eternal life. What are you going to do with them? What are you going to do with them? This is a warning to us as well. One commentator says, However, the parable of the talents was originally addressed to the disciples of Jesus. They were the ones who had been entrusted with the gospel. They were told to preach in, in Christ's name repentance and forgiveness of sins to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. But the teaching of the parable was not limited to the disciples. They are the original audience. They are the ones that if they had not fulfilled their mission, the church dies instantly. But as we know, the disciples were entrusted with much. 
and they made much from that which would, they were entrusted. I'll leave it this morning with the words of J.C. Ryle. Let us leave this parable with a solemn determination by God's grace, never to be content with a profession of Christianity without practice. Let us not only talk about religion, but act. Let us not only feel the importance of religion, but to do something. We are not told that the unprofitable servant was a murderer, or thief, or even a waster of the Lord's money. He did nothing. And this was his ruin. Let us be aware, or sorry, let us beware of do nothing Christianity. Indeed, let us take this warning of J.C. Ryle to be beware of do nothing Christianity. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your for your love for us. We thank you for the opportunity to serve you as disciples. Lord, I pray that you would have each one of us to be uh, proven true, that we would recognize the things that you have given to us, that you have entrusted us with, and that we would make wise use of them. Not for our own sake, but for your glory. But also knowing that you watch and you will reward. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This is Pastor Howard Sloan of King of Kings Reformed Church here in Bedford, Pennsylvania. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today, and I hope it blessed you. If you would like more information about King of Kings Reformed Church, you can visit us on the web at kingofkingsreform.com or you can check us out on Facebook at King of Kings Bedford. Either way, I hope you check us out and may you find the blessing of knowing and being known by our Lord Jesus Christ.